FETSAS plays an important role in the governance and management of all schools in South Africa, in the sense that there are so many legal aspects and governance matters in education of which most principals and educators still have limited experience. It is important for a school to be a member of FETSAS as not only are we the leaders in school governance and management, but we also train, inform, guide and advise all our members in best practice and experienced solutions. Who is FETSAS? FETSAS is the national representative organization for school governing bodies. FETSAS informs, organizes, mobilizes and develops its members to achieve and maintain the highest international standards in school governance and management. We advise within the public and private educational sectors, focusing on the foundation, intermediate and senior phases. A school's governing body or SGB operates primarily outside the classroom. It is the SGB's task to make sure everything outside the classroom is in shape that infrastructure, discipline, budgets, human resources and finances are efficiently managed. FETSAS can assist you with all the aspects of your school governing board's primary role, which is creating a conducive environment in the best interest of the school. Furthermore, FETSAS can assist in strategic planning, sound financial management and human resources aspects such as appointment, discipline and termination of contract processes. When dealing with appointments of principals, FETSAS wants to support you to appoint the best possible leadership candidates for your school, for the sake of our children. Be a part of FETSAS and know that you are part of a larger community that will always provide you with the latest information which is accurate and reliable. There is always someone within FETSAS who has the experience of past challenges and solutions, simply a call away. We at FETSAS will walk alongside you to take your governing body forward to achieve greater heights. FETSAS has extensive experience in education matters. As an active, dynamic organization, it is fully informed of developments and restructuring in the education field and can advise its members accordingly. FETSAS is a democratic, non-political organization and members elect their leaders along the lines of the national school governing body elections. What does FETSAS stand for? FETSAS believes in maximum autonomy for governing bodies and therefore strives to expand governing bodies' rights, competencies and skills. FETSAS supports and promotes governing bodies' powers and the rights as defined in the legal framework of the Constitution. South African Schools Act and Acceptable Governance Principles. Former State President Nelson Mandela said, Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Education is a great engine for personal development. Through education, the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor. Children of mine workers become heads of mines. The child of farm workers can become president of the country. Here at FETSAS, we do what we do because we love our children, we love our schools and we love our country. We look forward to being of service to every school governing body in South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this discussion. Today, we have a whole panel of people who are going to take part in this discussion this afternoon. We, we are going to talk about the water efficiency in schools. Let me just get my screen ready for you. There you go. As I've said, uh, we have a whole panel panel of people who are going to talk with Rian van der Berg, who is going to present this session. And with that, oh, sorry, here are the contact details of our provincial managers. If you don't have them, please take them down. You can send uh, email or WhatsApp to them. But Rian will also share his contact details at the end of this session. 
And with that, I'm going to hand you over to our presenter, Rian, for this afternoon. Rian, thank you. Thank you, Ilza, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to see some of the faces uh, online. Uh, I know it's a, it's a very interesting week in our school calendar. Uh, number one, it's a very important week in our um, country's calendar uh, with Freedom Day coming up. Uh, but it's it's like, I don't know if you guys have the same feeling, it's like start, stop, second term. Um, and uh, at some point in time, we were considering, is this a great day for a webinar? But if we don't do it, uh, it will never happen with all the um, diary interruptions with public holidays. So I hope you guys have a great week. We're going to be talking um, and, and continuing the discussion. Uh, I just want to share my screen quickly on what we started uh, the 14th of March was focused mainly on mitigating the, call it load shedding, uh, electricity supply issues in schools. Let me just get this done and share and see if I've got the right thing. And this must disappear so that I can share that screen. Hopefully you're seeing my screen. So we're continuing the discussion and the Center for Finance and Risk Management is always happy to bring uh, deeper discussion, uh, thought provoking issues uh, and helping our schools manage and govern better. Focus on finance and risk management is number one, it's, it's, it's just too difficult economically to have wastage. It's too difficult economically to not be running your core business. It's too difficult uh, what we see in the economic climate to make a mistake with your first installation of something and you don't have money to re, uh, redress that later on. So, so what we're trying to, to put through and put forward from the Center for Finance and Risk Management is truly to connect with great suppliers, great brands, and bring our schools value in that. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're in this relationship with uh, with FETS with <laughs> FETSAS and EPSA, and today we're also hosting Centricity as part of of the relationship in load shedding as well as managing water at schools. So I'm going to open uh, with a few remarks from us from my side. Touch briefly on the previous webinar, and then we're going to have um, two presentations: one from Ken Noons from Centricity. Uh, talking about what they've been doing, not what they're planning to do, what they've been doing in schools already. And then uh, Desiree from uh, APSA will also be talking. And then uh, a little bit brief panel discussion and Q&A if there are questions from you guys. And I want to reiterate, as a belief, vraag vir ons vraag. As iemand vraag het tik in die Q&A blokkie, please ask questions or make comments. We will get to you on uh, that one. Number one, welcome to our panel. I'm going to ask the panel to quickly open their uh, their cameras so that we can just see them. On the panel today, we've got um, Ken Noons from Centricity, uh, Desiree and Charlie from APSA, uh, public, uh, the public sector. Uh, Dikmar Nibur, we are very well, uh, very uh, privileged and fortunate to have an official from the Gauteng Department of Education. Dikmar is a Mechanical engineer, Dietmar, do you just want to say hi and uh, say who you are, <laughs> what your role is? Hello, Rian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you for inviting me to, to this presentation and the, this webinar. Um, I'm from the Gauteng Department of Education in the Infrastructure Planning Unit, and uh, I'm, I'm the Chief Mechanical Engineer on that side. And one of my responsibilities or my tasks is to, to look into alternative water and sanitation at schools and, and also to look into ways to, to conserve and improve our water usage at the schools in Gauteng. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dietmar. Dietmar does not have a presentation for us. He's uh, joining the panel uh, mainly as an observer, but we're very glad to, to have made contact with someone in the GDE and we will pursue other provincial departments of education as well. So, yeah. Um, Opening up, uh, Ken and Desiree will will introduce themselves as they they share their um, presentations. I've got a statement there: no amount of money can create water, and I think that's the focus of today. Even if we had no money problems, we're sitting in a situation where the limited resource of power, <laughs> on the one side, very acute, but water also 
we cannot make water if we even pay for it. So I think the, the focus in this cycle of webinars that we have with apps and centricity is truly sustainability and truly managing our limited resources. So just park that one, uh, and we're going to be talking about that and possible wastage as well as cost, um, because uh, schools are very, very price sensitive um, in this day and age, which they should be. And good governance would, would mean that we watch our rands and our cents. Just a quick feedback on the power uh, load shedding, mitigating the impact of load shedding on learning webinar that we had a few weeks ago, and that is still available on our um, YouTube uh, channel, as well as on Facebook videos, um, where we discussed the effect. We ran a poll and we saw so many schools finding it difficult to continue with business. We had a meeting with uh, GDE officials, um, and uh, hence Dietmar is part of our panel today, where we're trying to, from FETA's side, talk to the government, talk to the provincial departments to say, how can we make it easier on the finance side and the approval side of ensuring that we can work with uh, solar panels, PV, uh, inverter, whatever the solutions are out there, processes so that we can keep on teaching and learning. Core business is the main focus. And I'm happy to report that in the meeting that I had with, with the GDE, that was the focus. Can we keep the lights on for learners to learn? So, yeah, that was a good one. Uh, I just have some remarks there. Schools are being affected. We know that. Um, learning is being affected. We see that. Uh, communication is being affected. And, and that makes us less efficient with, with our community. And what we're seeing is that the mood is being affected. The wellness cycle is, is even being affected. And then what we're seeing is studying at home is being affected. So, yeah, that's a big issue. And we're continuing that discussion. I have some notes to share at the end uh, in our partnership with Centricity in the Center for Finance and Risk Management. I want to quickly highlight a little bit of governance issues and allow me just to, to frame it. Why does FETSOS have a Center for Finance and Risk Management? Because FETSOS is a governing body association and we cover the governance arena. The governing body is at the forefront of ensuring that we do good governance at schools. Uh, and uh, if it costs money, it's a governing body issue. If it doesn't cost money, it doesn't mean that it's not a governance issue, but we've got a responsibility um, as governors to ensure that we manage our schools and govern our schools at a high level. The sustainability of our schools, not just our schools on the finance side and the cost side, which is an issue, but also on the environmental, call it the green, the green focus side of things. We've got to take care of our environment. So it's becoming a big issue in our space and worldwide. So, so sustainability is a big issue for governance. If you're looking at the um, capitals that the King Report focus on to report on, the environmental footprint that we have is an important issue. Second one is the survival of the business uh, and the school's core business. Um, is that of delivering learning and teaching. And I see now suddenly that my lips are not synced to my video. Sorry about that. It worked just before the, before the event. Um, so, yeah, we need to ensure that we can continue with business. If we continue with business, we have less risk of not being uh, sustainable and not surviving any tough issues that come our way. And then if there is a possibility, if and we have surplus, more so on the electricity side, we can possibly be making money or securing ourselves even better at a later stage. That being said, I just we quickly want to run through two questions from our survey uh, that I mentioned in the opening that also covered our previous uh, webinar. Ran a survey on mainly uh, power side things, but also asked two questions uh, that pertains to the water side. 191 schools participated early in February, uh, affecting 133,000 learners. So, so you can multiply that by, by at least 10 to get the FEDSIS community and multiply that by um, yeah, a few hundreds to get to the, to the learners in the country. All nine provinces reported, Elson and hostel schools included. Interesting to me is that schools report that they have alternative water supply. So they're already making plans outside of what the city council is, is supplying. But nearly 50% of the schools do not have alternative water supply or a separate managed water supply. What is slightly scary, and I want to get back to the governance hat, is 
the question was, does your school have a sustainability or green subcommittee? And sadly, uh, a very small percentage, less than 25% of our schools reported that they have a special focus. Now, this can be one of two things. Either uh, the whole of the SUB is taking this issue very seriously because it's a big issue, or it's just not a traditional committee. So it's not being thought about and it's being run separately. My advice at this point in time, with the acuteness of the problems we have, economically, power, as well as water, I think this should be a subcommittee of any business says so uh, governance structure to say, let's put skills, focus and energy into ensuring that we can continue with business. I'm going to stop sharing my my screen and invite uh, Ken Noons to the to the stage. Uh, Ken, you're going to share your presentation, but you can open up your camera. So long. Ken is from Centricity. And we've been um, yeah, walking a journey for a while now, uh, got introduced several years ago, uh, again, through the uh, APSA relationship, made contact again. So yeah, Ken, uh, please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about Centricity, and then just give us the, the rundown on the water. Welcome. Thank you very much, Rian. Um, and we have known each other for maybe 10 years at least. Maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah. Close to that. Close to that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We are talking about um, water in schools um, at the moment, which is a subject that uh, Centricity has a lot of information uh, about. A bit about the company. Uh, we started in 2012. Henry is the CEO. He unfortunately can't make, be with us today. Um, and myself, we, we, he is the CEO and I'm the, the COO. And when we first started uh, Centricity, we focused predominantly on electricity, where the name basically uh, associates Centricity was supposed to be electricity from the sun. We soon realized from the studying of municipal electricity and in water invoices, we soon realized um, that water was a more serious problem back in 2012, was a more serious problem to schools in terms of costs um, than, than electricity. We, we created a, an online platform called First Look, and we uploaded a lot, all the, the bills from the schools that we were, we were associated with at that time, and we've continued to, to obviously improve improved on that, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, so water, we soon realized, was a very, very important issue. The initial, and we go through various stages in terms of the way we we try to analyze the data from the municipal invoices, because most schools do not have any form of monitoring of their of their consumption. Um, so we try to to get as much data from the electricity and water bills. Um, and then we start to analyze what can be the implementation of a series of uh, of energy and water efficiency measures because that's the end of the day is what we um, what we're looking to do. Uh, we've developed two principal online applications. One is solar PV for schools, which we touched on the last time, and then more of that will be um, we will be talking about in the next in the further months. And Aquastop, which is today, our main. Uh, our main function in schools is to create savings for schools in electricity and water. And we always go, we always tell schools, if we can't save you money, then we don't need to be there. So that's the premise that we are, we are functioning with. With your water, over the last, and this is real data that we've got from bills since 2012, municipal bills. And back in 2012, your average electricity, and, sorry, water and sewage uh, cost per kiloliter was 28 rand 50, which was quite high at the time. But you can see over the over the period between 2012 and 2023, which is where we are at the moment, um, it's 88, more or less 88.61. And that's taking the total cost of your electricity and of, of your water and, and sewage um, invoice and dividing it by the um, the, cons the actual consumption, which includes VAT, because VAT is the cost to the school. At the, at the moment, this is 88.61 percent, and in Gauteng, um, they're looking at about nine percent, nine point something percent uh, during this year, which starts from July 
the first of July this year, as, as you all know, everything goes up. So from from the beginning of July, we've you have you will have for the next year ninety six ren, the best part of a hundred ren per kiloliter. So the the actual reason to saving is is in, apart from it being a sustainable issue that we 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 that Rian touched on, it's very very financially conscious. You have to be be aware of. What we found, we so we started when we started looking in 2012 at the municipal invoices. Then we started to understand that we need more information, and data always tells the story. So we started looking at um, schools. We put in, in um, water meters, real water meters, check meters on the school side of the after the uh, municipal meter. We installed a, a water meter. And we started monitoring that on a daily basis, uh, where the information was being sent to us on a twenty-four-seven, sorry, on a twenty-four-seven basis. We found after some months of data capture that between forty and sixty percent of the total consumption was outside of school hours. It's incredible to um, to actually imagine that, but it's a fact. If you when you go into further details in your in your build, you we will understand this, and I'll come to that at, uh, later in the presentation. And the, the reasons for this is inadequate. Coming quickly there, yeah, I, I, I think that's critical, and I'm glad you you put a, a red circle around it. But I think I just want to attack that issue from two areas. <laughs> Please, if forty to sixty percent of consumption is outside of hours, it does not just speak to um, you know a leakage during outside hours it speaks to a leakage during in hours as well <laughs> absolutely yeah so so, 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 the, so there's a leakage problem and it's not just saving the the outside hours consumption which is not required but it's reducing the in hours consumption so that's got a double whammy effect do i read it right um more or less because it, what you normally find is that the in the evening times um, the pressure in the system is a bit higher because during the day there's consumption, so there's less pressure, let's say, in, in the system, um, not only your individual system at the schools, but obviously in the in the area. So in the evenings, the pressure is a bit higher, so you, you have this uh, this issue that is very real too. I'm with but, you. Uh, Thanks. You're, you're not incorrect in, in totally in, in any case. You said two things. Yeah, no, I think I think that, that the one is the wastage on the product, which is the water. The second one is this immediately speaks to finances. <laughs> you're paying and for you're paying for that water. Is that the right? Cost, the cost of the cost of forty to sixty percent of your water consumption could be three hundred thousand a year, and it is three hundred thousand a year on the average school. Um, so yeah, and. It's it's basically, as I say, uh, related to inadequate maintenance and a host of other things that uh, um, that actually goes along with that. But one what you have to also realize is that because schools uh, only operate are only operational for two hundred days of the year, in effect, sixty percent of the school year is outside of the time of the. There's nobody there. There's no one there. You know. So there's a there's a high percentage of time where between six o'clock in six o'clock in the evening and six o'clock in the morning, nobody's there in inverted commas. Um, Two hundred days of the year, that's the situation, and the rest of the time, there's nobody there in inverted commas. There's, we know that there is there is movement and there's functions going on at the schools outside of those times. But in any case, uh, this is very real. This uh, this consumption data, um, and there are exceptions, but it's maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Um, the average school has a thousand learners. And we know that there are about 20 to 30 toilet facilities um, within each. We're talking about toilets and taps and, and sinks and whatever else. And many times we've seen, you know, kids leave taps on all night because they're not functioning properly for whatever reason. We're talking about a, an installation that has 800 to 1,000 learners, young learners, every single day. And with all the the goodwill in the world, you can't maintain these things regularly enough. One school I can mention, Ravonia Primary, they, they have one person every single day that goes around at eight o'clock in the morning and all the toilet facilities to make sure the taps and the toilets and everything else are not leaking. So this that's the kind of intensity that we, we look at um, and the schools are looking at. 
Um, during the study period, I, sh we sh I should also say, uh, we found that there it's quite common that three, three leaks um, in toilets in these facilities, they've gone unrepaired or unnoticed and, and unreported um, for a quite tight periods of time. It could be days or it could be weeks. So the, the truth is that we're dealing with very active and live systems um, that needs constant maintenance, specifically in terms of water consumption. And we actually, Toyn Hendry coined a, a phrase which was base waste in terms of water, where anything that you, you have a, a 40 to 60 percent, that's your base waste. It's not base consumption as in electricity, it's base waste in water. So what we did was to look at each and look at, there are more or less 3,000 schools in uh, Gauteng. Uh, in fact, it's 2,946 more or less. Um, and the old, we've got about 18,000 municipal invoices on our platform first look. So we've got a good understanding of, over the last period. Um, this is going back, I would say, we've got bills going back from 2013, 14. So good 10 years. And so we got a good historical understanding of where schools are. Um, and primary schools, on average, they they would consume 100,000 kilowatt hours per year. And at an average cost of 2 Rand 90, which is higher in, in Joburg, but um, we are looking at about 300,000 Rand. That's what it costs primary schools a year. This would vary in the outside outside of Johannesburg a little bit, but uh, of course uh, the, the the rate the rate is less than Joburg, but that's what that's the values we're talking about. In high schools, we're looking at two hundred and seventy four thousand kilowatt hours, and it's very easy to understand what your consumption is. If you took twelve year twelve bills from two thousand and twenty two January to December, you easily establish what your kilowatt consumption is, um, and your cost divided by your <laughs> the total cost, and you know what you what this is costing. So between the electricity being consumed by primary schools, 600,000, and secondary schools, high schools, 700,000, we're talking about 1.34 billion a year in, of, of rands. Water, a lot of money. Water, we're looking at 550, uh, sorry, um, 5,694 kiloliters at a cost of about 62. And that's, we know that it's already 88 in in Gauteng. So this is this been compensated because it's a le less in Kurleni, in Swani, etc. So um, the average is about 62 rand per kiloliter. And if the average school is consuming 5,000, primary school is consuming 5,694, we're looking at water costing 354,000 rand, 355,000 rand in 2022, with a high school 657 which, interestingly enough, it's more or less the same, the two of electricity, 1.34 and 1.32. Um, if you save 50% of electricity, which is very easy to do, um, introducing all the measures that uh, we spoke previously about in the last webinar, and water, certainly you can save 40%. You can actually save colossal amounts of money, over a billion rand in Gauteng, we estimate. From the data that we capture in first look, we can see that your average cost per learner per year, which is interesting because if your school has a thousand learners um, and your consumption and your cost per learner is a thousand one hundred and eighty six rand, for example, in one this particular school, you're looking at a thousand one hundred and sixty eight times. 1,200 rand, a lot of money. That's what it costs just on water, just on water. This column just identifies costs of water. The average is around 500, uh, 539,614.7. The high special schools are 5,000 and 2,400. Um, and this much smaller school, again, special school is 2,000, is higher. But you have schools very real, 740, so it's a primary school uh, with 1,000 rand, 1,100 rand per learner per year in water. So the cost is colossal. Savings, in, and it's 
you need to monitor these um, and keep track of this every single month. So once we understand that there is a problem from by looking and studying your of your your uh, municipal bills, water and electricity, we start looking at separating these now. So we're looking at water. We start doing a pre analysis, which is looking at first look. We take as much details as we can from the um, from the the municipal bill, and we translate it into a status quo consumption and costs. You're doing nothing. You've been doing that for the last three years, and we generally use um, between two three years. As much bills as you can give us, we will we will analyze. There is a small cost, but um, we need to establish what your status quo is. And then we start looking at what's your detailed assessment and how can we get drilled down into from those numbers. And we do uh, walk, walk through audits um, and we look at capturing data for, for water rather than putting in a check meter, what we generally ask schools to do is to read your water meter or some schools have water meters um you will read those at the morning when you start and in the evening when you finish so between let's say six o'clock in the morning some schools finish at four o'clock some six six in the evening so between six o'clock in the morning let's say and four o'clock six o'clock in the in the afternoon that's your daytime consumption and six o'clock in the evening to six o'clock in the morning that's your nighttime consumption you would be amazed just by doing something as simple it's a no cost low cost uh um, low-hanging fruit, let's say, you can um, easy to establish. Once you start understanding what that is, then you can start looking at what your costs are and where your problems are and where your problems could actually be. Because once you start looking at these issues, you're saving 300,000 Rand per year. You're, you're refurbishing one of your bathrooms or two or three of your bathrooms or toilet facilities every single year. And you start with the ones that are have leaking the most, and you go through the whole system over the period of three or four years. So you can you you can finance your investments which, just from your savings. Very interesting um, way of looking at it. In fact, because a lot of schools, what they tend to do is if they save, they spend it on something else. But in fact, the more you spend on your infrastructure, the more you will save on the long run. Um, and then we go through an implementation stage. And this slide you will you will spend you will see a, a lot more of this because you've got access to the presentation. But these are the various steps that we look at um, in terms of the design solutions and how we go through each individual saves if the need is for aqua stop, and which I'll touch on in a minute. Because what we what we did was to when we discovered that in the consumption was 40 to 60 percent outside school hours. We basically invented, I would say, uh, Aquastop, which basically is looking to eliminate waste, only that. And what we do is to remotely cut off your water um, in in the evening and turn it back on in, in the day. And if you have meetings, you can override it. Whatever you can do, you've got full control. I'll come to that in a minute. But Aquastop is really a tool that has assisted and saved a lot of money for some schools and I'll touch on that again in a second. Um, what we do is where your water, this is an inst a typical installation where the municipal meter is outside of the, the, the line of the, the fence of the school. We just dug and exposed the pipes and we installed our Aquastop system with our control panel. And it basically looks, if not the same, better than it did from the beginning. So at the beginning, so it's just a very, this, this took four hours to do. Um, it went through a lot of um, a lot of stages in terms of getting to, uh, to understand what the consumption of the school actually was. Um, but there's a component of both electricity here and water. This is now the control panel that we have. And that control panel that controls this valve is basically this. This is your valve, this is your control panel, and this is what you see on your computer or, your, or on your mobile. So everything is in the cloud, and you, can, you will have access to this data whenever you wish. Um, and this is, the, this is what we see as the admin of the various schools that we, that we have. Um, at the time when it's on, when this is on, means that the valve is closed, and when it's off, the valve is open. Very simple. Um, and you were able to schedule 
the on-off times, as you can see here, this school opens at six o'clock. The red means that your valve is 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 open, and at four o'clock, it's um, it's closed. So you can see that the the actual time that it's off in this particular school is more and more than the time that it's on. So in other words, it's it's open. The valve is open less time than the valve is closed. Maximum saving at weekends. We just open for um, an hour each. This is each um, thing is uh, an hour, uh, half an hour. So four is an hour. So we 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 open for an hour, or half an hour each time. Um, so that if there is a need, some schools have this. This particular school has a, a JoJo tank because there are people living in the school. So we just top the tank the tank up three times a day, which is more than sufficient. And it's it's a small tank. In fact, it's only a thousand or two thousand um, liters, more than enough for the families that uh, that stay there. And what's interesting is that if you took your electricity and water costs, and in this particular typical, very typical school you could, you saw just now is 1.3, 1.352 million rand per year. And we're increasing at six and a half percent per year. This year, electricity is going to be 18.6%. Water is going to be 9 point something percent. So 6.5% average for the 25 years, which is the life of a solar panel, and certainly the life of your, your infrastructure, if you were to change all your underground pipes. You're spending what, 1 million, 1.34 million, 1.35 million a year uh, in 2019 as well, and you're looking at 84 million over 25 years. If you save 60% of that, it's going to cost you 34 million. So just by spending a small amount of money up front, you can save a lot of money on the long term. Um, and this is really a, a very important for schools to, to, to get to capture the concept because you can actually invest in the first five years. You, you're actually spending 1.352 million a year over five years, which is within your not much more than your um, SGB period, you're looking at 8.2 million. You can spend 6 million and you can resolve a lot of problems in your schools immediately. And the payback is immediate. Um, this is one school where we had 1,130 learners. We went through all of the various um, stages in terms of analyzing the data. And over a period of a year, we had data from 2020, but then I've posted here what it was in two, from 2020. The red is what the schools were sending us that data. We translated it into, into this graph. And we installed the Aquastop in March. So from April was the first full month. This is, this is the average. And you can see, <laughs> this is the average that you're looking at that the school was consuming a, a 340, 277, 600 and 85, we reduced that to 67, which is colossal. The saving and, and in fact the payback is less than a month in that in that case. So it's very, very important to to do um to do things like this, but you have to understand the data. This is Bryanston Primary. Um that from the savings, and I'm sure that uh well Johan Usterusen, who's the birth of the school, he's given us uh, permission to, to say we saved the school by the installation of Aquastop, 2 million rand in the first year. And by that, by the, after the first year, he started in, installing from the boreholes. He's got, they've got two boreholes. They installed Jojo tanks, a water treatment plant, which costed about 450,000, including all the infrastructure works that was needed. Um, in terms of the roof coverings and everything else. We actually paid back for this system 450000 in less than eight months. So by schools taking this kind of initiative, you can save colossal. And we will, in fact, the first million will be saved. And we, we uh, I think it was in November 2000, no, August 2021, uh, we commissioned the system. Um, or the system was commissioned, and in July 2023, they would have saved the first million rand. Incredible. So uh, it's quite colossal what you can actually do and what you can achieve once you have data. And 
I, I appreciate it. And, and your last line is what I want to pick up on. It's amazing what you can achieve when you have the data. I'm going to ask uh, Desiree to get ready so long, but maybe just a comment on that. I think what stands out to me, oh, now I want to sneeze, this, the, the, the data speaks for itself. But if you don't analyze or capture the data, it means nothing. And we're all driving blind. And if it's still going all right at the school and the finance, the, these these are sunk costs. <laughs> we know that we pay 300,000 rand a year, so we keep paying 300,000 rand a year, but we don't know if it's the right 300,000 rand a year. So I just returned from England from the uh, British Education and Technology trainee, uh, Trade Fair uh, bet. And um, one of the things they, they highlighted there is the new word, datafication, and I'll probably speak about that more in the Center for Technology, but datafication is suddenly a word where 10 years ago, gamification was a thing. So datafication of things is important. I sit around the Brian, I see friends showing each other what's happening with their solar system at home currently on their apps. Like, did you see, you can see now this is running it. So the data is very empowering and, and equipping. Uh, just a short short tagline, someone said, in God, we trust all others must bring the data. And from a governance side of you, let's look at the data. Your, your finger is up before Desiree talks. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, and it's interesting, picking, the, picking up that point of sharing data, schools are very reluctant to share data. And it's one of the things that we really, really need to force and, and get schools to understand. Sharing data will save them money. There are schools that we know They've been spending 30000 a month for the last X amount of months. Um, so they're not, they've budgeted for it, so it's not a problem. Yeah. You Thanks. Know. Desiree. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Desiree and Charlie, uh, friends at EPSO, we've been also working together for a while now. Uh, Desiree, I, I can see your screen. You can go to full screen. Uh, thank you for, for sharing time with us and thank you for being part of this uh, relationship uh, with the Center for Finance and Risk Management and Sun Trustee. But over to you. Just introduce yourself. Uh, let the people know who's here. And I think Mark is also in the um, panel. You can just refer to him. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, Rian. And good afternoon, colleagues. Um, you know, as APSA, this collaboration for us, it's so important. This collaboration between ourselves, uh, FEDSAS, as well as Centricity, um, it's a collaboration which has been going for, I would say, more than four years. And, um, you know, it speaks to our aim as a bank to provide funding, which is not only uh, developmental, but, uh, you know, funding which is also sustain sustainable and uh, you know, protecting our environment. So it's forums like this, which we participate in, where we, we tend to learn more about our clients and their requirements. And uh, you know, going back into the bank and saying, this is what the market is looking for and how can we respond to that? So in the past webinar, um, you had had our head of renewable energy, uh, Justin Smith, who had presented to you. So today there is no presentation as Rian had said, but it's just merely um, recapping on, you know, the contact details of the people that you can contact internally. If you're looking for funding, if you need to discuss anything with regards to um, solar PV installations in your school. Uh, we have had subsequent to that uh, presentation by Justin, you know, a few schools coming to us and saying, um, you know, they're looking for information and, you know, some had actually applied for funding. So there is a need in this regard and we are here to help you. And, um, you know, just on this slide, um, you know, we've got contact details for Mark Poli. Uh, please contact him if you need any guidance or you can send your emails to me and I will be ha happy to assist or direct you through to Mark or to, to Justin's team. Um, and, you know, we thought maybe let's just share, you know, based on what Ken has just um, discussed, you know, uh, water management is so important to us. It's a scarce resource and, uh, you know, we need to preserve it in any way that we can. And we like the fact that, you know, Centricity had a solution and it spoke exactly to what we were looking for. So what we had done, um, you know, at the beginning of our relationship, we had donated um, aqua stop installations at, you know, a few schools. And, um, you know, as you can see, the savings, the annual savings in those schools came to about 1.1 million uh, per annum. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic solution in terms of uh, make, making sure that, you know, you mitigate your water losses 
uh, after school. Um, so, you know, we, we do still have about five more schools that we, we still can donate to. And, uh, you know, perhaps that's something that uh, Rian and Ken can, uh, can, can discuss. You know, we, we cannot just say to schools that, you know, um, manage your water, man manage your electricity consumption and so on without actually sharing what is it that we as a bank are doing. Um, you know, we are a large bank, yes, and we've got a, a large footprint and it's important that we reduce our carbon emissions uh, footprint. So what we've been doing in terms of renewable energy projects, you know, we have been installing solar panels in the branches that we, you know, we own, in the corporate offices that we own. And our aim at the end of the day is to, in terms of our energy consumption mix, to have at least 10% of our energy uh, needs through renewable energy. That um, picture that you're seeing here is a picture of solar panels, which is on top of our Absa Towers uh, campus, which is in, in Johannesburg. And we do have installations in some of our branches as well. And then just in terms of water management, um, you know, we, we do have a number, a thousands in fact of, of employees in our operations. And, um, you know, water management is critical to us. We do have a full team, in fact, it's a department which manages our water and um, energy consumption. So in Absa Towers North, which is in Johannesburg, which is our largest building that we own, you know, we had installed, you know, uh, this water tanks and, um, you know, on an annual basis, basis, we're actually saving about 14 million in, ter in terms of liters. And uh, we, we've installed, um, you know, this water tanks in five more buildings and in three buildings, we've actually installed uh, boreholes. And we do work with the uh, local municipalities you know, in terms of, you know, if they've got water restrictions, we've got to adapt ourselves as, as a, a, a company to make sure that, you know, there's business uh, continuity. And then, you know, obviously, we you know, within the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape, you know, there was a challenge with regards to, um, you know, um, shortage of water at some stage. And last year, what we did, you know, we, we within our buildings, you know, we took about 16 kiloliters of potable drinking water as well as, uh, you know, grey water tanks so that, you know, you know, our businesses and our branches can um, continue functioning. Waste, um, and I'm sure you know, back in the day, you know, it used to be said that the banking industry was actually not a banking industry, but it was a paper industry because we generated a lot of paper. Now, moving to digital means of, of operations and encouraging our clients to use di digital, digital means of banking, you know, we have substantially cut down on our paper, uh, um, you know, generation. We actually are even taking out some of the printers that we use because everything, everything now that we're doing is, um, is digital. So, you know, we re recycle up to about 16 different types of, uh, of waste material each single day. And, um, you know, we use our food waste um, you know, it is transformed into fertilizers and we use it in our gardens and, um, and less landscaping. And, um, you know, this is a little way in terms of which we as a corporate are trying to have that positive impact in terms of, you know, the environment that we work in and, uh, you know, within our communities that we, we operate in. Um, thank you so much, Rian, and thank you, colleagues. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, thanks, Desiree. Um, thank you for, for sharing that with us. And I think it's leading with uh, a little bit of intent, but also leading by means of uh, example. And yeah, Mark's details are on the, were on the screen and your details. Anyone can contact me at any point in time as well so that I can pass on um, uh, and, and make the connection. We, we have two questions in the uh, Q&A uh, box. If there are any other questions, I'd love to, to look at those. The first question is an interesting one, Desiree. You might just have your first of five. <laughs> um, and how can you help township schools in these high rates? Because most of them are no fee schools and cannot have a huge budget for such wonderful saving installations. So it's can't afford to not save but can't afford to to start the saving process um and yeah maybe maybe i can uh, get lizzo to to be in touch with you guys uh and see if there's a possibility of, of looking at these savings but maybe just talk to your csi project and possibility of how do we help township schools yeah and and maybe can can come in here as well are we talking about um, aqua stop um, and yeah. what we've got still remain 
So um, we, we, we have tried to get into township schools. We would love to get into township schools, even if it's just two or three, especially the ones whose, you know, whose municipal bills are, ve are very high. Um, you know, just so that we can demonstrate the effectiveness of, of you know, this intervention. So, you know, if, if there's one school that we can get into, by all means, um, you know, if we can have the main, we will definitely consider it. Um, you okay. know, we have been to basic education yeah. as well um, in that so regard. So, so I'm going to ask the school to contact us. I also have a special offer, which I wanted to end off with from Centricity to FEDSAS member schools. Um, and, and yes, we have negotiated for FEDSAS members a uh, not a blanket 25% discount on their services, but for the first 25, no, not 25% discount. We've got for the first 25 FEDSAS schools, we've got a 20% discount on the centricity costs. Uh, Dietmar, you can open your screen. You can be part of the <laughs> discussion here because there's a question coming your way shortly. Um, but so um, we can talk to APSA. I, I think we've got to put a focus. It can't afford to not save in the township schools because that, that one school saved 300 and something thousand rand a month on your CSR, a year on your CSR. That's a lot of schooling that can take place. So let's, let's open the discussion. Ken, over to you. Just unmute. Just quickly on the point that Desri raised, normally what we find is that the township schools are Section 20 schools, which are the which the uh, municipal invoices are paid by the GDE or the, the provincial government. So it's very it's very difficult for us to have an intervention there. And if they, and in fact, we, we've seen schools that were exactly in this situation where thousands upon thousands upon thousands of kiloliters every month was being used. And I'm talking about 3,000 kiloliters every month. Um, so, and we couldn't do anything about it because it's up to the departments to do that. We actually can only influence the schools and I'm sure that APS is in the same situation. We can only influence the schools that has a, an SGB and has an SGB that functions well. And this yep. is really the critical point that you mentioned about your um, green. Yep. Yeah, so... Good governance, yeah. No, so, so schools can contact us. Uh, Dietmar, you want to add something? If I can also come in on the township schools, um, definitely we, we have great interest in the township schools as well from the GDE perspective, because as Ken just mentioned, um, not only due to that reason, but we, we also cover um, those, those um, bills in, in a lot of cases. And um, we, we've seen high bills and we, we're busy looking into that. Um, it, it would be great to implement water conservation in, in these schools. I think often it's, it's also a behavior problem as well. And I can't stress that. I mean, that behavior is really something important that we have to really want to encourage to all schools, not even the township schools only, um, that, that we look into improving water conservation behavior. Because it's not only, um, like, I, th I think Ken painted a really good picture about the extent of savings that we can have through conserving water. We see it that, um, with the bills we're paying for some of the schools as well. But it's also uh, in the Gauteng province, we're a water scarce uh, province, um, of our country. Um, getting water to Gauteng is, is not, it's an it's expensive place to get water to. So in general, we've got a responsibility to, to really look at all schools. Um, I think the, the township schools do depend on the on us as well, but from a also technical expertise per, per, um, point of view, um, it's always not that easy to recognize uh, the, the losses that you make, especially if you're not paying the bills. Um, so we, that's definitely on our radar to look into that. Yep, One of the ways, if I can just quickly uh, get into that as well, is, is maybe through uh, to explore these uh, CSI initiatives, you know, uh, corporate social investment initiatives as well, because in, especially in the township schools, um, there, there's great potential to maybe involve them in, in these type of water saving initiatives. Um, that's right. something we're looking into at the moment as well. Thanks, Dietmar. Um, and thank you for that input and being available. Uh, just I know that our audience is not all from Gauteng, keeping in mind that some of the township schools might be in other provinces, but the same structure should be in the provincial education department there. And APSA is national footprint and Centricity and FEDSA is both national footprint. I'm going to jump to a few questions there. They, they're popping in as we talk. Um, good question. We have a garden at school. How do we convert waste food to fertilizer? Um, I'm going to park that one a little bit because I, I think we can, we can uh, answer that one offline, but One's got to ask the question, how do you convert? How do you um, 
uh, we, we, we do it at my house. My, my wife recycles everything from the kitchen. Uh, well, us as a family, not just my wife. We, we put some stuff into an organic um, compost heap, uh, add some stuff. But uh, Lizzo, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this one uh, afterwards. Uh, next question. Many examples of schools being ready to invest in solar, uh, but being prevented by the lack of urgency from GDE in issuing approval to install systems. Uh, I have dealt with that at the meeting that we had shortly after our previous webinar with the department. And we've got a commitment. We're busy on a proposal phase with uh, some documentation from FEDSOS to the GDE, have had discussions so that we can fast track the, the approval um, process. I see there's another question about SASOB being against uh, or making it, uh, what's the question? Prohibit schools from entering into lending. SASOB does not prohibit the school from entering into lending. It prohibits the school from entering into lending without MEC approval. <laughs> So there are two things. It's the approval for continuing, even if it's with the school's own fees. And the second one is approval of the lending contract so that we can somehow fast track the lending process because the urgency is now as well as the timing um, uh, of it. If we wait long, the saving, you know, we, we just kick the can of the millions to save down the road. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. But please contact me uh, uh, Julian, I'm not going to throw you under the bus. <laughs> not going to give you your last name, but Julian, yeah, please, please chat to me if, if there's anything. Contact FEDS us in this regard um, so that we can expedite the application and the process there. Um, you don't have to be an APSA client to gain access to this kind of funding, or uh, is the question rather Desiree? Do you have to be an APSA client, APSA client to be um, benefiting from this uh, opportunity that you guys are creating? Okay, are we talking about funding of solar panels or are we talking about the installation of AquaStop, the, the yeah. remaining uh, we, five we generations? Not, I'm, I'm assuming it's funding of solar panels. The AquaStop is, is possibly not something to fund. It's it's less than 100,000 rand. Uh, yeah. It's less than 70,000. And if you're one of the first 25 schools, it's about 50,000. So it's not a big yeah. deal. But yeah, do you have to be an APSA client to be participating in this process either way? No, yeah. no, you don't. Um, your, your financial statements, your credit worthiness um, are what we will focus on. And, um, you know, if your financials stack up, then, um, you know, we will, we will look into, into your funding. But, um, you know, obviously it will be subject to MEC approval, as Rian has yeah. mentioned. Yeah. So, so there's, the, there's the credit approval side of things. It's a pure lending contract and the bank will look at uh, repayment ability. And then there's the MEC approval side, which fits us will... Um, help facilitate and expedite the process, uh, which we're preempting already without having so uh, such um, contracts on our table. Um, Ken, uh, how does load shedding affect the power of Aquastop if we don't have solar? And second, what is the cost of implementation or uh, yeah, the cost implication of Aquastop? We did not say that. It's part of my closing, but I think it's, <laughs> it's a pertinent question. So go for it. I'll go for the first the first part of that. Um, and it's a very, very important question. In fact, it's one of the first things that the, the, the engineer that uh, developed the system with us said, if we have, and we don't connect Aquastop to the fire hydrant lines, obviously, of, this, of the schools. We connect to the main water supply of the school. So we, t we shut that water off, um, but it doesn't affect anything relating to the, the fire the hydrants. If there is a um, there is a load shed, the valve will automatically open, um, and this has um, happened and is happening every single day with our system. As soon as the the, um, the electricity is comes back on after load shed, it just sets up and it closes again if it's outside of school hours. So there is that uh, that difference. We're looking at the possibility of putting a battery back up to that uh, only because of the extent of the load shed that we've been having, because we don't really want to 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 actually do that, um, even though it doesn't interfere with the um, with the actual fire hydrants of the of the school. We just want the if there is a fire and there is um, an aquastop is closed, that could be a problem for the school. Um, so it's it's a tricky one, but the reality is is yes, it it opens. The cost you you've already been talking about 
Yeah, I think you've thought about uh, these questions, uh, and, and I want to ensure the the audience that you know this is not uh, from yesterday. So I, I think many of the questions have been thought about, and there are good answers for it. I've got a last quick question here. I wanted to start closing. Have local councils been engaged to encourage excess solar production to be fed back into the grid? Uh, as far as I know, not yet. Uh, local councils um, have not yet, well, from our side, not yet been engaged. I don't know, from GDE side, to feedback. Uh, I think that's where we're getting to. Number one, first saving. Number two, to be secure and not down. But number three, possibly, uh, and I'm talking about power here, um, to sell it off and generate income for the schools. Dikmar, I don't know if you've got an answer on that. Uh, you can just shake your head, but but that's a very good question and, and we will take it further. Thanks for that one. That is part of the discussion. Um, if we can prove these savings, we, we definitely know that, that there's something to be able. Um, yeah, I think I'll take a few of these questions offline and, and just continue the conversation. We're coming to the close and I'm not even going to share my screen again. I quickly want to just give you my... Uh, uh, closing and and some special offers that we're running. First of all, thank you to our panel, Desiree. Thank you for for being part of this. Ken, the data speaks miles. Dietmar, thank you for for sharing thoughts, even though it'd be limited to Gauteng at this point in time. But I think we've got to take hands uh, upstream, downstream, and sideways to ensure that we save a scarce resources a resource that's all of ours. <laughs> You know, the fact that my tap has water doesn't mean it's endless water. So we've, we've got to work at it. Um, we're going to close the session with, with a quick highlight. Um, Centricity has offered a spe special FETSAS member only deal. On Aquastop, a 15, no, I lie. It's a 20% saving, which equates to roughly 15,000 Rand. Aquastop is roughly 77,000 Rand, which includes the license fee for the software for year one. So the equipment is around 50,000 Rand and then the licensing. So, so um, that's got to run so that we can analyze and make sure that we've got the data that speaks to it. And thanks for that. On the PV side, the solar panels, similar situation on the tender process as well as on the um, uh, pre-tender process for the first 25 FEDSAS member schools. But I will share this details with everyone that's on the, on the webinar uh, uh, 30% saving on the pre-tender process, which is, you know, significant percentage. It's not a high cost, but but it does help. And then a 20% saving on the tender process, which is roughly uh, costing at 22,000 Rand. So that's a 4,500 Rand saving on that and probably a 3,000 Rand or 2,500 Rand saving on the um, pre-tender process. And a ballpark, 15%, uh, I'm not 100% sure, 25 uh, uh, 15,000, 10 to 15,000 saving on the Aquastop. So that's good money on the table for, for schools that want to engage. So contact me. My contact details have just been shared in the chat box. We really appreciate you uh, sharing your time with us. I know it's a broken week with all these holidays. Uh, we'll make this uh, recording available. Thank you to our panel. Uh, thank you to everyone for, for uh, having a, a chat with us uh, and and. If there's any question, please give me a shot. Um, my email address, rian at fetsas.org.za or tech at fetsas.org.za. My cell phone number is available. Um, if, if you want to give me a shot on email, I will I will give you my, my contact details. But uh, be in touch on email. Have a great week. Have a wonderful Freedom Day. And let's think about the solutions that we can create. Uh, Thanks, team. Let's just wave and <laughs> all say goodbye there. Thank and you very we'll much. Session. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.